In Skyrim, one of the earliest weapons you can get your hands on is a steel sword, but it's not really all that special. So what if you found that same weapon in Fallout 4? Would it be any different, or would it secretly be a weapon designed by a god to kill a god? That's what we'll be finding out today. Can you beat Fallout 4 with only the steel sword? The rules are simple. No exploits or glitches. I can only use the steel sword to damage enemies. And for armor, I can only use the fortifying iron helmet since it's part of the same pack from the Creation Club. With that out of the way, let's get into it. As always, I started by making my character and then setting my stats. For damage reasons, I went 10 in strength, 10 in endurance for health, and 4 in perception for lockpicking. That last one will prove crucial to the early stages of the run. Next, the world ended and I gave some rad roaches the slip, allowing me to escape the vault and begin my heroic journey to the comic book shop. But first, I had to make some pit stops along the way. The goal was to visit as many places as I could to gain enough experience to level up and then take the first level of the locksmith perk allowing me to pick advanced locks. And to make this go a little faster, I stopped by the Cambridge police station to help out Dan's and fight the ghouls. Only issue is, after Dan's killed all of the ghouls, the quest never completed and I couldn't talk to him. So with that quest broken, it was back to sightseeing until I got my perk. Now with my fingers officially sticky, it was time to do some discounted comic bin diving. I made my way inside Hubris Comics and immediately got jumped by the remains of a Magic the Gathering tournament. I picked the only lock I'd ever need to pick and then raced upstairs to flip through some notes before I was cornered and talked to death about how bad the Power 9 reprints were. On my next attempt, I made it to the roof and did some parkour to get away from the Red Deck Winds players. I get it, it's a viable strategy, but I'd rather make it to turn 5 before I lose the game. Although, I was quickly put in my place by a turret and some landmines left from some Yu-Gi-Oh players across the street. Apparently I got sent to the Shadow Realm as the wall behind me fizzled out of reality. Okay, third time's a charm now. I dodged both of the groups of card players and ran to the roof again and grabbed a key to unlock my actual prize. A furious steel sword that did more damage with every swing on the same target. But it also had a base 50 weapon damage which is kinda nuts this early in the game. Surely it won't be too powerful. I also equipped the fortifying iron helmet to complete my look for this run and then tested out my new gear on the raiders. Which all went down with a single hit. That's okay, these raiders are just super low level enemies. Let's try something a bit bigger. I tried to fight Swan and it went about as well as I'd expect, so since I was in the neighborhood I decided to go ahead and break Nick out of jail. And those poor Triggermen never stood a chance. This sword was doing insane damage for being this low level. I mean, I'm level 2 and I'm dealing more damage than an upgraded combat shotgun. Like, this is a baseball bat I picked up off of an enemy, and my sword was dealing almost as much as it and a security baton put together. And once I got the first rank in big leagues, I was now dealing over 60 damage. This may not sound like a lot, but at level 3 now, this is insane! But as insane as it was, the fact that I wasn't wearing body armor meant I could still die if I got a little too crazy. If only the Triggermen knew this. Because I was hacking and spinning and oh yeah, I saved Nick in the process. I tore through the poor souls that got posted to guard duty after swapping shifts for a Friday night out with the boys. Because cracking cold ones will inevitably lead to some naked fuck with a stick breaking into your place of work. Nick and I made it to Skinny Malone and I decided to show him my newest interpretation of a strength user in Dark Souls. And then once Nick was free, I went toe to toe with Swan again. Literally three levels later and Swan got molly -whopped. I have a feeling my damage will never be an issue for this run. I made it to Diamond City and asked Nick if he poured milk into his cereal or cereal into his milk and he skipped his answer by asking me about my missing son. I wonder if he even uses milk. Before I made my way out of the city to break into Kellogg's place for answers, I tried to get Ellie to read me the newspaper. She was not keen on helping me out. For Kellogg's house, you need a key in the mayor's office, and while I was heading up, I saw someone being held at gunpoint and dancing while doing it. I tried to get closer, but I kept forgetting how to use my feet. But being back on track, I stole the key to Kellogg's house and then tried to save the man being aimed at by taking out the no-gooder. Surprisingly, no one shot at me. 
I picked up the body to discover that the NPCs followed wherever the body went. So of course it was a Weekend at Bernie's vibe as this newly deceased person sprung to life to hang out with his friends. But once they learned their friend was no longer dead, they left. So now I had a body to dispose of. But as I dragged him away, his brother followed closely. Like, real close. So to torment this poor guy, I dragged his brother around the city and tried to get the robot chef to cook him. When I was refused a free meal for bringing my own meat, I dragged the body onto a roof. But when I went to leave, his brother was now on said roof. How he got there, I didn't know, but I wasn't going to allow this. Only the robot chef wasn't too pleased and shot me into next Tuesday. Okay, enough messing around. I broke into Kellogg's house, found the intel, and ran like a new episode of Chainsaw Man was airing over to Fort Hagen for revenge. So by this point, my sword was doing 78 points of damage per swing. Note, this is not modified in any way. This is still the base weapon. However, the fort wasn't a cakewalk. Since the synths were using laser weapons and I wasn't really wearing armor, it ripped through my health, so I had to be quick and stop being stingy with the stim packs. I ended up at Kellogg and this man had no idea what was going to happen. Between Vance attacks and then getting slapped like a fish, he went down faster than me after work and after checking his go-to websites on his computer, I was off to dive through his brains. Nick offered himself up to be fondled to progress the quest, but I smacked him out of his chair and Dr. Amari was just using finger guns. What kind of scientist uses finger guns? Before I could ask any more dumb questions, I was thrown into the worst parts of the first Max Payne game and then sat listening to dumb dumbs give me classified intel. So now it was time to head into the heart of Florida, and on my way I decided to test my might against a terrifying enemy. Except what's more terrifying than the fact that this is an alpha deathclaw is the fact that this deathclaw got smacked by a naked guy. And the naked guy won. And this went on for pretty much every enemy in the glowing sea. Rad scorpions, sting wings, and even more deathclaws. I met with Virgil and was informed to go take out a courser for the chip that housed a lot of juicy institute secrets. To get it, I'd have to somehow survive a super duper hard- I'm just kidding with you. I had to cut through a horde of gunners, and much like the Triggermen in the beginning, they didn't stand a chance. Between the straight melee setup I had for perks and the absurd damage this sword did, making my way through these guys was nothing to write home about. I mean, by this point, the sword was doing 91 damage, and even the courser got smacked. The most ruthless thing the Institute had got sent to the bargain bin faster than Anthem did. So with the courser chip in hand, I made it to the railroad to decipher said chip, but instead of leaving these guys for good, I decided I would do their quest line for once. You know, to offer some variety. So I went and got the schematics to build a teleporter before starting a quest with Deacon, and now the real game could begin. Deacon wanted me to help him meet with a contact on a bridge, who I freaked out by not answering with the code phrase. And then we had to break into an old base of ours and recover a prototype for our local drug de- I mean doctor. I wish I could say this was a tough fight, but this sword had other plans. With the mission being a huge success though, I was officially part of the railroad. Now that I was on their payroll, I was able to deep dive into railroad quests. I met up with a man named Stockton in Bunker Hill who needed help getting a runaway synth to freedom, which consisted of me waiting in an abandoned church, meeting up with an escort, and then taking a very scenic route through Boston with no combat. So as uneventful as that was, I started thinking about Endgame. I told the railroad of my teleporter plans, raced to Sanctuary to build them, and then was inside the Institute. Only there was a small catch. Apparently, the railroad had a contact inside the Institute who was helping Synths get the freedom, and now I was tasked with not only finding this contact and working with them, but also working for the Institute as a double agent to keep my cover. So I met with Father and told him how much I loved science and indentured servitude, and then met his homies but in the process met Patriot, the railroad contact. He had a big operation he was working on, freeing 17 synths. Now, for the rest of the video, I want you to keep that number in mind, because you're about to witness genocide, acts of mass surprise birthday parties, and employing raiders to do my job for me, all for the low, low price of 17 synths. 
Patriot couldn't just free the synths though, he had to break into a pre-war system with a username and password that had to be obtained from the old Cambridge Polymer Lab. So there I was. Inside I met with Molly who attempted to show me a slideshow, but I figured I could do this quest faster than she could bore me to death. Next thing I knew I was killing ghouls, hacking terminals, and crawling through the roof. But I not only got the password I needed, I also did a small science experiment for a piece of gear that I'll never use. Now at level 13, our build was beginning to take shape. Two ranks in bloody mess for extra damage, solar powered for extra bonuses to strength and endurance, rooted because vats attacks count as standing still, thanks for that heads up, toughness and big leagues at two, and we were looking pretty solid. With the password in hand, I met up with Patriot and Z114 who was leading this jailbreak. I was instructed that to keep my cover, I'd have to continue doing missions for the Institute before the right time to move would show itself. To please the Institute, I was tasked with recovering a rogue synth who was leading a group of raiders. I had to fight my way up some makeshift base made out of boats and then got blown up by a fat man. I forgot one of the raiders carried that here. I think every time I've ever had to deal with these guys, he gives me trouble. And this went on for a fair while, mind you. I just could not get past this guy. So now channeling my inner chakra, I ran through the water and after a close shave with death, I was able to finally take him down and move in. I found a legendary shotgun that did 68 damage and compared it to my now 101 damage sword. I think I can safely say this thing is never going to be outperformed as far as damage is concerned. And it was so intense that it broke dialogue with the runaway synth and one shot his two guards, allowing me to teleport away, mission complete. Next up was the Battle of Bunker Hill. I spoke to Desdemona to cover my ass in this assault and got to work cutting friend and foe alike, but this is where I learned that the Brotherhood of Steel was going to be my biggest adversary yet. Between their power armor soaking up multiple attacks from my sword and their laser weapons laughing at my naked body, I had to be strategic with my attacks, which meant running around and hiding until I got my opportunity. Inside Bunker Hill, the chaos continued. The Brotherhood were the main targets, but if a synth attacked a railroad member, they got slapped too. I found some synths in the basement and then let them all go to please the railroad. Father was pissed about this, but this is what's going to happen when I'm trying to please two completely opposite factions at the same time. So with his rant out of the way, he invited me to a board meeting to tell everyone he had Ligma and would be retiring from life soon. And instead of the perfectly capable scientist, he was entrusting his life's work to someone who refused to wear pants. To be honest, that would have been my choice too. To make sure the Institute would live on forever, I needed to go secure a new source of power. And wouldn't you know it, the Brotherhood of Steel had one such power source. Getting through the Brotherhood wasn't too bad here as none of them had Gatling lasers, but the real test would be getting the new battery out and not dying to radiation. Oh, by the way, our sword is now at 115 damage. My first attempt had me die while waiting for the release to open, and the next time I took enough drugs to make Woodstock look tame. But if you're wondering why I'm not dying right now, I also have no idea. I turned the purifier on when I got back into the room and I even got health back, so I'm not quite sure what happened here. Maybe I'm just special? Anyway, then I smacked a couple robots to get out of here. But the lobby became overrun with Brotherhood members and I couldn't stand for that, so of course we had to clear them out. Next up was me trying to convince a scientist to join our cause. Normally, if you have a high enough charisma, this quest is easy, but considering I only had one point in charisma, all I could do is basically just word vomit to this poor guy. And to no surprise, I failed, so they had to call in a synth to put him to sleep to escort him back to base. And for some reason, word of my vocabulary stew got back to father and he had me record a message for the Commonwealth when we inevitably took over. So I went and set up a radio in Diamond City, and then changed our batteries for the future. But now, with my mission being to kill the railroad, it was now or never. One of Z114's messengers met up with me to go over the details of the new plan. Except it was more of a warning. Apparently the Brotherhood of Steel had found the railroad's location. I raced back to warn everyone, but we were still attacked. There were a lot of close calls here. The knights in their power armor were tough. But with the clever use of a door, I was able to lure them in and thin out the herd. 
However, since we were no longer safe, it was time to remove the Brotherhood from the equation permanently. To do so, we needed to steal a vertebrate and fly up to their massive sky blimp, which was easier than it sounded. Between the knights outside and the tons of members inside, I was turned into laser swiss cheese more than once. But this wasn't the hardest part. Once the Brotherhood had been dealt with, I had to guard Tinker Tom while he read his spicy fanfiction. At first it was just more Brotherhood Knights which got slapped, but then they sent in their own vertebrate. Even though my sword can do tons of damage, I can't hit anything flying through the air. But I can lure it into a raider fortress and have them take care of it for me. This took about 15 minutes, but due to the fact that the driver of the vertebrate couldn't hit anything not labeled as a building, the raiders just used their pea shooters to eventually bring it down. With Tinker Tom having finished his private session, the next part of the plan was able to commence, throwing a surprise party for the entire Brotherhood of Steel, with fireworks and all. We didn't crash and die on the way up to the sky blimp and Deacon tried to get me to put on clothes, but I've gotten this far and I'm not putting on pants now. The Brotherhood didn't care for my lack of clothing and were sure to let me know, but I was only able to deal with one of them at a time, so slowly but steadily they went to sleep one after another. I planted some fireworks for the upcoming celebration and I was on my way out when I ran into Elder Maxon, who hates surprise parties. He really hates them. I had to down two Nuka Cola Quantums and tons of other sports enhancing treats to even stand a chance. But Elder Maxon got slapped and we were able to fly through the pretty light show before setting off the surprise party. All this is over 17 cents. My god, it's only going to get worse. With the Brotherhood on a permanent vacation, it was time to make our move and send the Institute on their vacation. I walked in and took out the entire welcoming party to allow my homies to pour in, and then we went on a very relaxing walk and a perfectly normal day for the railroad. I slapped some gorillas, slapped some old man, then slapped his personal pleasure robots. I ran into a reactor and set it to blow, yelled at some kid, and then threw a second surprise birthday party in the same day. But hey, besides being a birthday party planner, we now know that yes, you can beat Fallout 4 with only the steel sword. I didn't expect this weapon to be this strong, like in Skyrim it's just a regular sword, but in Fallout 4 it's probably one of the scariest weapons in the right hands. Not mine, but it still got the job done. Next video I'm going to try something a little spicy, but if this and the next video do okay quality wise, I'll look into streaming the Sanctuary only challenge again, as the new setup is still a ways away. If you liked what you saw, please consider subscribing as it helps the channel out a ton. Plus, if you have a suggestion for a challenge run you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below. I play all sorts of games, so no challenges off the table. I want to thank all of you that watched to this point. The channel has been growing absolutely exponentially, and I can't thank you enough. And as always, I have been Chris from Crisis Gaming, and I will see you on the next one.